Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We continue in our series of Ephesians. I'm getting right in because, because here, here's the thing. I love praise and worship. I love it. But when God's already speaking in the worship, we need to get into the word because he's going to continue to speak. And what God says is true and his word is truth. And so we need to receive this today. And we need to be just as, as excited for the word as we are for worship. Amen. Because they're both about God glorifying God and receiving his truth for us today. And welcome to Calvary. If you're, if you're new here, we get a little excited about what we've inherited in our relationship with God, what we have received from Christ. And we don't apologize for it. We just, we love God and we're excited. Just like if our, our favorite football team won, we get excited. We get even more excited about God. Amen. Last week we talked and learned about uh, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 and Paul had this beautiful hymn or song with no periods in it, no stops. You have to read verses 3 through 14 without stopping. And I've never tried it because I didn't want to pass out. But basically, if you don't read the whole thing, you could misinterpret what it means. And we learn that in that we have all of these promises and blessings in Christ. For instance, we are holy when we believe in Christ. We are blameless when we believe in Christ. This is how God views you. We are forgiven. We are saved. We are redeemed. We are accepted. We are loved. We're part of a family. We're adopted in the family of God. That's what we learned last week. Now you think that would be enough to Paul, but Paul doesn't stop there. Paul wants that, he, he prays for the church in the scriptures we have today. So we're going to be in uh, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. And I believe that if we can grab a hold of this, we're going to be stronger in the Lord and understanding what we've inherited in Christ. And Paul literally prays that the church, and this goes for us too, that we would not only believe that to be true, those promises, those blessings in Christ, but that we would experience them, that we would live out that life. In other words, you have been forgiven in Christ. The question is, do we live forgiven? Do we live as if we are forgiven? Or do we hold on to shame and guilt and have not walked out of that reality and into the reality that we are forgiven? And we can know that we believe we're forgiven because we can also have the ability to forgive others. So that is what Paul is wanting us to do in this scripture. I'm, I'm just telling you up front so that we can understand what we're reading when we read it. Now, it wasn't until I became a pastor that I, I didn't realize how much I didn't believe in this. I struggled to believe in Christ what I have received. I actually struggled to, to really come to grips and realize all of the blessings that I have in Jesus. And then as I started counseling and discipling believers in this church and outside of this church, I realized that they also struggled to believe what they have received in Christ. And it hit me that we struggle with this. And here's a few reasons why. One is just we have a lack of knowledge in knowing what blessings we have already received in Jesus. Okay, so that's why Paul covers that. Paul wants the church in the first chapter to realize who they are so that when the devil comes at them, when the enemy comes against them, they won't forget who's with them and who they really are. And when we don't know those, of course, we're not gonna walk and live free. We're not gonna walk and live accepted and loved. Then another reason could be is that we haven't experienced this out of a lack of faith. In other words, I, I, I know that the Bible says I'm forgiven, but do I believe I'm forgiven? A lot of people will say, um, they'll teach about how to forgive yourself. And the Bible doesn't really necessarily talk about forgiving yourself, but what it does talk about is believing you're forgiven. And when you believe you're forgiven, then you will realize you can forgive yourself, amen? Because you can't forgive yourself in a sense. God has to forgive you first. Then you accept that forgiveness in your life. So 
a lack of faith can keep us from living out these realities. And lastly, just a lack of remembering these promises that we have. We live in a physical world, so our mind is always on the physical. You know, we, we can kind of forget who we are in the spiritual. Church, you follow me today? The world is right here in front of our eyes, but we live by faith. And so we have to remember who we are as we live in this world. Our eyes stay on the eternal, they stay on God. So our scripture today is Paul's prayer that the church would understand and experience these realities. So let's read it together. We're gonna start off here with the first verse. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. I love, I love this, by the way. This is a pastor talking about his church here. He says, asking God, so praying constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom. This could also mean spirit of God, or a spirit of wisdom, so the Holy Spirit and his wisdom, and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light, so you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader, or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. Paul loves to use the body analogy to explain the church, and Christ is the head. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. I love this first verse. This, this pastor, this apostle, this Paul, he says, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. There's two marks of a, of a, of a true follower of Christ in here. True followers of Christ are characterized by these two things, loyalty to Christ and love towards one another. Paul is thanking God that this church is faith, faithful to God, has faith in God. By the way, faith in God can also mean faithfulness in God, faithfulness to God in the Greek. And a love towards one another. Two marks of a strong Christian right there. Two marks of spiritual maturity. Faith in God, love for one another. Amen? Now here's the thing about that. That's actually fitting with the greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you would love yourself. So he is acknowledging that this church is strong in the Lord and in faith and in love towards one another. I love how Paul takes the time to appreciate the church and the growth that he sees in the church by Jesus Christ. The church is growing because they're in Christ. I love how as a, as a pastor, my own life, uh, I got to tell you, I got to show you a picture here. Personally, quite a few times I get a little choked up about our church. And um, this one really stuck out to me, even though it's happened recently. But I I was at the Blue Hand Mall when we did our food distribution back in Thanksgiving time, uh, the weekend before Thanksgiving. And we had almost 100 volunteers outside at the Blue Hand Mall of our church uh, together serving hundreds of boxes of food to our community. And I got to be honest with you, I got a little choked up because I'm watching our church work together to take care of, of the needs of our community. And not just that, but the Operation Christmas Child and giving out boxes for, uh, for kids around the world. The, the operation in this lobby is, is amazing. 
Uh, the share the joy. We get to witness families crying as we give their kids gifts. When moms and dads come in because they can't afford to, to pay for gifts. Or just the fact that someone's leading a Bible study in this church and helping people understand who they are in Christ and grow. I get choked up. I, I thank God for this church and your faith and your love for other people. It's amazing. I just want you to know, just as, just as Paul thanked his church and is thanking God, really, I thank God for you all the time. What I love about this is Paul took the time to see the good in people around him. You know, we're, I'm a parent, but I'm also a disciple maker. Can I encourage you, uh, whether you are a parent or not, whether you're actively serving and helping people grow, here's something we can do. We can look for the good in people. We can look for the spiritual growth that's going on. How many times do we always look for the negative? God forgive us. What about all the good that God is doing in people's lives? Paul probably could have critiqued this church all day if he wanted to, how they weren't perfect and how they could still grow. But you know what he does? He takes time to say, you are strong in your faith in the Lord and your love for everyone is amazing. And I thank God constantly for that. How many of us need to make sure we, we see some good in our spouse today? Amen. Especially on Valentine's Day. When's the last time we said, I see something amazing in you. I see, what about your kids? Do we see the good in our kids? Do we see the good in our, in our coworkers? Do we see the good in this church? Let me tell you, church, we are blessed. This church is a blessing. The fact that we can put this technology together to make sure we're reaching someone all the way in Texas and Florida. We had someone watching from Iran we have it so good here. And by the way, the team does a great job of making it look sharp too, right? I mean, that doesn't matter as much, but that's not the first priority. But the fact that, I mean, we got the, the, new, the new server to help it not glitch every 30 minutes or the wheel just spinning on your screen. We have it good here. The fact that we can gather today in this building, we have heat. Thank God, <laughs> might be a little too warm up here for me. But we have electricity, we have it good here, amen? Paul takes the time, oh, I went ahead on us. Paul takes the time to say, thank God, I thank God for the growth that is going on in your life. So let's be good at that. Let's make sure we're seeing that in each other as well as in our loved ones and our family members. He goes on to say, I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those who he, who he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Now, the NLT interprets this a little differently. I don't like it as much. Most interpretations call it the spirit of Spirit of Wisdom, with a capital S. And that's because it's pneuma, which in the Greek is the Holy Spirit. So Paul would techni technically be saying to give you the Holy Spirit and his insight and wisdom. So Paul is literally praying that his church has more of the Holy Spirit to understand what they've inherited in the first few verses of this chapter. Then he goes on to say, and insight. So by the way, the, that's, the, that's pneuma, okay, the Holy Spirit. Now, wisdom and insight, the word used there is Sophia. Anyone named Sophia in the room? And I could be butchering it because it's in Greek, but it means intelligence or objective facts. So in other words, head knowledge. So he's saying, I want you to have the knowledge, the facts, the intelligence of God and all the blessings he's given you. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I don't want you just to have the head knowledge. He goes on to say that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Why would he talk about it twice? Well, in the Greek, this is, oh, I did it again. This is new for me. I'm learning. In the Greek, I don't want to butcher this. It's epignosia. And in the Greek, that means to experience intimately the knowledge of God. 
So to be in a close relationship, in other words, you don't just know of God, you really know God. You're familiar with God. You're familiar with the blessings of God. In other words, you don't just know that you're forgiven, you have felt forgiven. And you have experienced forgiveness. How many love it when someone in the church forgives you? I know I do because I've needed forgiveness. By the way, church, that's why we need to forgive each other. When we don't forgive one another, someone doesn't experience the forgiveness of God. I said it because it's true. We are the hands and feet of the church, of, of God. We are the body of Christ. And the mind of Christ says to forgive and love one another. So the church must love and forgive each other to help people really experience God's promise and blessing of forgiveness. Praise God. Amen. He goes on to say that he wants, he's praying for light. Light here can also be the spirit so that you can understand. So in other words, enlightenment, illumination through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will illuminate something and help you understand it so that you can understand the confident hope. We can be confident today. Amen. We don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to guess whether God loves us. We don't have to guess whether or, or not or have this hopeless fear that Jesus isn't coming back for us. Now, this is twofold. The hope is, is that we are blameless and holy in Christ here on earth, but also the blessed hope of the future return of Jesus Christ to take his holy bride to be with him forever. That is what he's talking about here. So it's an earthly reality now that you are made right and holy, but when I come back to take you as the groom to be with me forever, you're going to be my holy bride, and we get to look forward to that. In other words, you don't have to be afraid whether your groom is going to come and take you. Now, that sounds weird for us guys, but the church is the bride according to the Bible. It's an analogy of marriage. And so we know that God is going to come. Our father, gentlemen, men, our father, our heavenly father is going to come and claim you forever. You've already been claimed. But gentlemen, if you didn't have a dad in your life one day or your whole life, and, and you're still learning how to be a dad today, just so you know, your heavenly father loves you like a father. And he's, he's coming to take you and to claim you as his son, like you already are, but to make it permanent forever. Ladies, same thing. It's amazing. This is the, this is the confident hope we have. So Paul's prayer is that the spirit of wisdom and revelation may enable and empower believers to know here and experience here and for firsthand these spiritual blessings for themselves. Do you feel accepted? Because you should. Church, do we help people feel accepted in the family of God? It's so important that when someone enters into the family of God, they feel the love. Now, when it comes to reaching outside the family of God, we still show love according to Christ, right? All right. There's our words for you. Spiritual, I got ahead, didn't I? Pneuma, it's a Greek wind, breath, spirit, wisdom, Sophia. So Sophia, you're a wise one if you're in this room right now or online. And then knowledge, epinesia. So let's look at this though. Did you know that we cannot truly know or experience God without the Holy Spirit? That's why a rebirth in the spirit, salvation in the spirit is key. That's why only a true believer will truly experience these blessings in Christ. He says this in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 12. This is Paul. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God's prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. So we know his love for us through his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And when we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. 
That's why Paul says, I pray that they would have spiritual wisdom and insight to know what God has freely given them. That is my prayer for you today, church. That has been my prayer for myself for many years. And the Holy Spirit helps you understand how loved you are. That's why someone has said when they're sitting in this room that suddenly they realize their love during worship. Because the Holy Spirit comes in and helps them know they are loved. Because they gave their life to Jesus Christ in their heart and spoke it and said, I am saved by Jesus Christ, that they feel that love. He goes on to say this, and let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Yes, I, I gotta tell you this. I, uh, when I read these verses, when I read these verses, I get convicted. Because look at what Paul prays. Here's a question, what's on your prayer list? What's on your prayer list? Paul puts things that are not physical on his prayer list for his church. He puts, now he does do that, but in this portion of scripture, he's praying for us and his church to know the spiritual realities, the blessings that we have already received. That's what he prays for. Every time I read Paul's prayer list, I get convicted because my prayer list does not sound that good and that spiritual. You know what I'm saying? And it needs to. It needs to. So what's on our prayer list? What are some things that we're overlooking when we pray for our kids? What's some things we're overlooking when we pray for our spouse? When we pray for our family members? When we pray for the lost and our neighbors? Are we, are we praying these kind of prayers? Well, today we'll start, won't we? Praying for the growth and the knowledge and experience of all the spiritual blessings. Well, let's get it. This is a powerful portion of scripture. I also pray, he continues to pray. This should be uh, 19 here. That you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. For us who believe him. For us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. This scripture is screaming uh, an important verse. And let me see if I have it here. No, I don't. Let me read it to you. I have it on my notes. It's, it's screaming an important verse. Psalm 110.1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor. Oh, now I know why. I got ahead. My goodness. Here we go. I am so sorry. I got so excited, I got ahead. My tech guys were right on it. Check it out. That is what we have in Christ. We are, where am I going? <laughs> Lord, help me. There we go. I think I just experienced grace because you all laughed at me or with me. We are powerful in Christ. Thank you for that. Amen. He finally got to it. We are powerful. <laughs> That's great. In Christ. The question is, if this verse is true, like all the other verses before it, why don't we live with this realization? Why is it that we go back to our old ways before Christ and live as if we're defeated and not forgiven and not powerful over sin and death? Why are we living in fear if the reality is that those who believe him have the same power that raised Christ from the dead? Why is it that we are in bondage of habits that are wrong and sin? Why are we afraid? Why are we in bondage of anxiety and fear and all those things? It may be one, a lack of knowledge, two, a lack of faith, but it also may be we just forget. And we need the Holy Spirit to remind us of who we are in Christ and what we have received in Jesus Christ. Jesus made it possible for you to be forgiven of sin and overcome death forever. That's the same power. And I'm doing it again. My goodness. Here we go. When we believe in Jesus Christ, 
We were raised from spiritual death and given new life. Surely through faith in Christ, we can handle everything else in our lives. Wow. So I, I, I'm pushing the wrong button again. Over, back. Okay, forward, back. Now let's keep going. Now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Wow. So there's two things I want us to understand, and, and here's what it is. This is screaming Psalm 110.1, and I did it again. I'm still doing it. My goodness. Here we go. New pointer next week. They're going to do a tutorial on how to click a pointer for me this week. The Lord said to my Lord. Now, this is David saying, God said to Jesus. Now, this is before Jesus was even born. So this is prophecy through the psalmist David. Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Now, this is God saying this to Jesus, and David is seeing this and hearing this word. Okay, he's, getting, he's got a word from the Lord. Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool for your feet. Well, guess where we've been seated according to Ephesians 2.6. For he has raised us from dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. This is a reality now, not later. We'll fully realize it later, but this is a spiritual reality now. That means that just as everything else is under Jesus' feet, all evil, ruler, powers, all authority here in earth that is against Jesus, we also are seated next to Jesus, which means all of it is under our feet. This is the power we have received in Christ. This is amazing. It just took us forever to get there because of this clicker or the guy using it. Wow. So the authority of Jesus now watch, I'm going to go backwards on purpose. Okay? Now he is far above any ruler. The authority. Jesus has given us authority over evil power in this world. Jesus has authority over evil powers in this world. And lastly, Jesus is life to the church. What we see in the scripture is Jesus is life to the church. This is what he says. It says... God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church and the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Let me show you something real quick. This is gonna represent God and, and this is gonna represent us. Now, if we're under Christ and we're in Christ at the same time, which is possible because Christ is the head, so we're under him, but we're intertwined and woven in him, God is wanting to pour into us all of himself. The problem is, is we're out here trying to find all the things that he has already completed and is in here. I'm not accepted. I need to find someone to accept me and love me. I need someone to forgive me. And God's over here saying, it's done. It's here. I'm right here. So if you're an unbeliever, just so you understand, everything you're chasing for is not, is not out here. It's under here so that God can pour into you. If we would just stop searching everywhere else, he will pour into you. And by the way, I think I purposely got a small opening because sometimes we got to slow, slow down long enough in life. Us Christians, we're so busy doing everything else. We're so busy going to everything else that we don't slow down enough. And, and, and he's, trying to, he's trying to pour into us and we don't know how to just slow down and get in his presence again. 
And so we're over here chasing all these things in life, like power, position, money, and all that stuff. And we're, and we're, we're over here, and he's like trying to do this the entire time, but we don't slow down enough to be still in the presence of God and let him just pour his power, his life in us. We are looking for completion, and the scripture says that he makes us complete. We're looking for wholeness, and the scripture says that he gives us wholeness. Look, I mean, this is Jesus. Jesus longs to fill us. It's what he does. It's almost like Jesus can't help but complete you. Think about it. If the Bible calls him a riving, uh, a riving, a living, did I, did I wake up early or what? <laughs> what in the world? A living water that never stops flowing. That's who Jesus is. He can't help but overflow into your life if you're around him. You're going to get filled with Jesus Christ if we are in and under his authority and under him, where we belong. The right place, the benefit of the church, the scripture says here, read it. The scripture says, I'm afraid to go back because I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna get the wrong slide. It says, for the benefit of the church, Jesus is over us. Not just because of authority over evil things, but for completion in Christ. He longs to fill us and make us complete. But the thing is, we must long to slow down. We must long to remember we belong in Christ and not in this world. We are full and complete when we are in and under Christ. Church, this goes for us individually, and this goes for us corporately. As soon as we get off, it hurts the whole church. As soon as we walk away from God, as soon as we take our eyes off of God and off of Jesus, it can hurt our church. I'm going to tell you right now, Pastor Ryan's passion in life is to be in and under Jesus. And that's for my own life, but I realize the responsibility I have as a pastor of this church, if I'm going to steer it in the right direction, I better be in and under Christ. But church, it's not just me. We're going to learn in chapter four that all of us have a responsibility to be in and under Christ. It's when we get away from Christ that things start going bad in churches. And then something really important doesn't happen. Because we're stronger when we're full of Jesus and less of this world. Right? But something else important. A church full of Christ can carry Christ in our world. A church full of Christ can carry Christ in our world. Our, our world is hurting. They're looking for a completion. And yet, we're vessels that can store and carry completion in Jesus. Paul's prayer to the, for the church was that, one, he thanked God for them. He recognized their growth, but he wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted them to fully realize and grow in their knowledge, but also their experience of living out all the spiritual blessings he mentions in verses three through 14. And the new one, that we have the same power who raised Christ from the dead. Confident hope that you can't find anywhere else. This is Paul's prayer for the church. And church, I can't think of a better prayer for us today. Thank you for being patient as I try to navigate this screen in my notes. And I pray that you took away today that the Holy Spirit is ready to help you understand what you have received in Jesus. Not only just understand it here, but actually live it out and share it with everyone around you too. Can you imagine what it's gonna be like in this community in Dover, Delaware, if we got a bunch of people from this church walking free and confident in Christ? Satan's gonna be scared, but the world is gonna be changed forever. Let's pray. And then Dorothy will be coming up. God, we, we want to know 
you deeper. We want to know you and not just know you with our head, but know and experience intimately what we have received in our relationship with Christ. Oh God, help us to live out these realities. Help, help us, God, to have the spirit to, to show us the understanding, the spiritual understanding of what we've already received. It's already been done. And for those who don't have it yet, it's already been done. God, I pray that you would bring people to you to be under you and in you in a relationship. God, I pray as believers that we would slow down enough to remember who we are in Christ, that we would get in the word and we would get in prayer and we would get in your, in your presence and in the spirit through worship, whatever means we use, and that you would reveal and remind and help us experience these realities firsthand in our lives. And God, by faith, we already have them, but by faith, now we walk them out. By faith, we walk free today. By faith, we walk forgiven, accepted, loved, adopted. We walk with power, the resurrection power. We can overcome anything that comes against us and the church but we must remain under the authority of Christ and in relationship with him to remember that and to walk in the fullness of it. And God, I pray today that you would complete brokenness in this room. That God, you would fill holes and brokenness and hearts that are hurting. God, fill it in Jesus name. By faith, you've already done it. You already done it, but by faith, we receive it in Jesus name. That real, true reality, that spiritual reality, we receive it today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Praise God.